Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Samantha Pruitt from Endurance Town USA with my co-host, Shan Riggs. Shan Riggs here. We are both currently in um, isolation quarantine in Sydney, Australia, getting prepared for the Thousand Miles to Light event. And we have a special guest today. We're super excited to talk to Marshall Ulrich, the one and the only. Um, and so let's just go ahead and dig in, shall we? Marshall, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well, and thank you very much for having me on your podcast, Endurance Town. And uh, um, it's nice to see you again, Sean. So thank you. Uh, fire away, guys. I'm, where, I'm an open book. All right. Marshall, <laughs> where are you located? Where are you living these days? I am living in Evergreen, Colorado. I'm a Colorado native, and uh, I lived in Idaho Springs at 10,000 feet and uh, you know, I would uh, spring up and do a little bit of mountaineering and stuff, and that was an ideal climate for that. But uh, I'm at a, about 7,400 feet here in Evergreen, so it's it's very nice here. Okay, fantastic. And so how long have you lived in Colorado? Is that where you were born and raised? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. And so the nature of the outdoors and the outdoor life just was built into your upbringing and your DNA? Well, you know, I think it was, I grew up on a dairy farm. And so I worked with animals. We went out and worked the fields and, uh, you know, way back in the early sixties, a lot of it was manual labor, uh, you know, buck and bales and stuff like that. So I look at uh, some of the endurance sports as sort of an extension of that. Uh, I just grew up doing it. And so it just seems like a natural thing to me. Okay. A little bit of a country boy. So did you also play sports or you just worked physical farm labor? Well, it was physical farm, farm labor, but then in high school, junior high, I used to wrestle. That was my main sport. And I did just a, just dabbled in track just a little bit. And I can remember going out and, you know, running up to the uh, bridge out of Kersey, Colorado, that was a mile and a half away. And uh, so it was a mile and a half out and a mile and a half back and I think that's the furthest I ever ran and let me tell you we thought we were really doing something back then because <laughs> nobody else did that sort of thing that we knew of anyhow you were teenagers you were doing something yeah <laughs> so that's yeah exactly for a teenager yeah so at what yeah. point in your life did you discover running for something other than training for wrestling well, it wasn't until I was 28 years old, I lost my first wife to cancer, and uh, the doctor said I had to do something to sort of lower my, my blood pressure, so I started running, and, um, you know, I stretched the distances from five to six Ks and started mar marathoning probably within a few months, and I really didn't get into ultra marathoning until the mid-80s uh, and did my first uh, 50 miler. So I discovered then that, um, you know, I wasn't fast enough. Take, for instance, I could run a 258 marathon, which is not, you know, that great. But if you stretched it out, it seemed like I could keep going. So uh, and going and going. Yeah, it kind of, I think it kind of found me more than I found it. Yeah, well, what's amazing is you were given advice, you know, to basically heal your heart, literally. And you chose running to be the tool for that healing. Yes. And a lot of it was just practicality, where it was very easy to just put on a pair of shoes uh, other than, you know, getting on a bike or something like that that involved a lot of equipment. So mm -hmm. I could get it done real early in the morning and, uh, you know, I'd have the rest of the day. So and, and you can get a lot of bang for your buck. Uh, you, you know, you do a 10K or something in the morning and. Uh, then that pretty well sets you up for the rest of the day. And if you continue on with it, it sets you up for just a lifestyle that is healthy. And, um, you know, speaking of which, uh, you know, the mental aspect, it really did bring down my blood pressure. And so I never really had to go on medication either. Wow, that's fantastic. Did you uh -huh. build a community around that? Did you find um, a way of community? I don't know if you have you know, friends or family or running club or children or anything like that, you built community around running? You know, not so much just because, uh, you know, it was Fort Morgan, Colorado. So there were a few runners that I'd bump into here and there. And sometimes I did occasionally go out with them. Um, 
but uh, it was mostly a solitary thing. And I found that, you know, very healing up to a certain extent. And um, as I progressed, and I think particularly uh, when I was running across the United States, which is, you know, going to be our, our main topic, um, I found about halfway through or two thirds of the way through going across the United States that uh, I couldn't do it alone. I needed other people's help and I needed to communicate and I needed to connect with them. So um, it was sort of an extension and I flipped over into a different type of healing mode in that uh, I started reaching out to other people too. So uh, originally, you know, the first 20 years I was all kind of hanging out there by myself. And, uh, you know, my community was the running community, but it would be mostly like take, for instance, I'd go out and do bad water and I do that on a yearly basis. And, and they were essentially, those people were my family. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? The power of that, right? The unity that comes in um, the love of a sport, but also yeah. how you understand immediately one another because you have this shared experience of moving your body through space, you know, it's just, that's so cool, so powerful. And we want more people to be doing it, of course. So we don't wanna, you know, any type of moving your body in community to me is, you know, it's therapy. So we need more and more of that in the world, more now than ever, don't we? We absolutely do. I would agree 100%. Mm -hmm. So some of your running shenanigans, I'll just call them, you went from basically, um, running for your physical health and your mental health, obviously. And then at what point did you decide, hey, I'm running longer and longer, I should probably toe the line at a few of these ultra races? You know, I think it happened fairly quickly. I started running in about 1978. And by 1985, I started looking around for something more than just a marathon. <laughs> uh, once again, you know, I just wasn't the quickest or anything. And you know, I tried to be competitive, but it's pretty tough. Um, and, you know, that was that was during the time, the late 70s, when, you know, Frank Shorter had, had already won the Olympics and he caused a big running boom. And so, you know, it was contagious. Um, but then, you know, about 85 or so, I started poking around and I saw an article, I think it was in Runner's World, where uh, someone was talking about Western States 100 and and uh, I started looking at that and I thought, God, you know, I, th I, I should go out and try that. And, you know, I don't think I was particularly intimidated by it. I, it was just more of a curiosity than, than anything. So I gave my hand a 50 miler and, uh, you know, was off to the races from then. Uh, and I did enjoy, you know, just um, seeing how far I could push myself. And it got to the point where, in some of the competitions, I, I could actually do pretty well. So your first hundred was at Western States? Um, my first hundred, let me think about this. It, and how it was Western States. Yeah, how old It was Western States. I was 30, I was 38 then. I just turned 70, by the way. Yes, when was your birthday? <laughs> Happy birthday. I, well, it's uh, it, it's July fourth. Oh, okay. so anyhow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're an Independence baby. Happy birthday! <laughs> yes, thank you. Seventy, and you're still crushing it. I love it. So you moved uh, from the hundred milers, and then um, at some point, I mean, you've worked your way through all the epic races many times, but then at some point, you sort of segued into doing, you know, just self adventures and and things that you just created on your own. You know, it was like the next level of Marshall would just keep evolving over, over time. <laughs> what was that about? Or what is that about as your own well, uh, development? I, I, I think a lot of it was, um, you know, of course, I wanted to see what I was made of. But I also uh, felt that um, people underestimated what they could do. And so I wanted to kind of show them what could be done. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I think it was the early 90s. I, I really kind of started doing that uh, with uh, take, for instance, doing the Leadville 100 and then the same weekend going up and doing the Pike Speak Marathon, you know, back to back stuff that people would would say was crazy or quad, you know, Pike's Peak uh, runs. And so that those were kind of the early stages. And it just kind of 
evolved from there. And I looked at it as more of a creative process. You know, incidentally, I have a degree in fine arts. So oh. uh, it sort of was uh, an extension of that creativity where yeah. I found it kind of fun to just think up things and then uh, put them into action for the most part, uh, you know, if I, if I could anyhow. <laughs> so, and sometimes I, I was really in over my head, believe me. Yeah. You're yeah. still standing. You're still standing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and essentially uh, what I consider uh, the hardest thing I did was run across the United States. Mm. And I think what made it exceptionally hard is, you know, you go out and you do maybe 60 miles a day and then you go to bed and what do you have to look forward to the next morning, another 60 miles a day so you could psych yourself right out of it. So it was really a mental game, as, as you well know, Sean, uh, mm -hmm. as, as well as, uh, you know, taking care of yourself. And, you know, uh, I had probably at that time run, I'm estimating maybe 70, 75,000 miles over the course of my career. But doing that one run across the United States, I learned more than all the adventure racing, all the mountaineering, all of the running that I'd done about myself, how to fuel myself, how to keep myself going. Um, and of course, I was 57 also. So I was, you know, I was kind of pushing the age there limit of, of um, or I felt I was the envelope. So anyhow, it, it, it worked out well, but it was very tough. You're making me happy because I turned 52 while I'm in quarantine here. Yay! I, I didn't really find running <laughs> until I was almost 30 and ultras till like 40. So I feel like I still have so much potential and unexplored opportunity left. I mean, I don't even feel like there's a limit, right? But everybody yeah. in my yeah. age group is trying to tell me otherwise. And I'm like, oh, you're just not hanging out with the right people. <laughs> I'm going to call Marshall every true. day. Hey, Shan, let's dig into running across the United States. You have a bunch of questions for Marshall. Yeah, um, this is great, Marshall, and, and uh, I've, I've read your books, and, and I've watched that documentary of you running across the United States, and it was one of the inspirations I had, but it was interesting, because when I decided I was going to run, the first thing I decided that, that uh, I wasn't going to do it the way you do, I wasn't going to go for a record, because I, I saw <laughs> the, the extraordinary pain that you went through. Um, and, uh, it, uh, while I wanted to challenge myself, I wasn't sure if I really wanted to, to go so far that I was going to need to go to the hospital and, 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 and those things. Um, uh, can you, can you expand a little bit more on, on the actual physical part of it? How did that go? Um, how did you continue on when you had things like, I forget what it was, was something like a, a broken foot or something like that? I can't recall. Exactly. Oh, well, I, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, quite that serious, but, uh, you know, good for you for making that decision, because that's one thing that, you know, I would like to do eventually if I could get around to it is uh, my wife, you know, she was so, uh, she fell in love with just that idea of going across the United States. So, you know, one of my uh, goals in the future is to get her in shape and, and, you know, the two of us just walk across at a slower pace and enjoy things. Uh, and I think it'd be an extraordinary experience, uh, you know, maybe do 30 miles a day, maybe 50 K or something and, and cut it off there. So um, you feel like a human being instead of, you know, just, you uh, I don't know, like a wild animal or something scared and, you know, of defeat and whatever it is uh, that's going through your mind. So, um, yeah, but at but, the same time, you said that uh, uh, you, you learned some things about yourself when you when you did do it the way you did, where you pushed to the absolute, uh, you know, uh, envelope. Um, can you expand on that a little more? Well, one of the things that was so striking to me at, uh, you know, the age of 57, I was shocked at how slowly I went. And for the first probably thousand miles or so, I was beating myself up because, you know, here I am running uh, three or four miles an hour instead of four or five miles an hour. And I'm just having to stay out there. Uh, you know, I, I think I kind of average 17 to 18 hours of running per day. So, you know, I was just out there all the time and I kept thinking to myself, man, if I was just, you know, 
a little bit faster and mm. you know 10 15 years ago i could have done this uh, you know and and been in bed and gotten more sleep and so on and so forth but the reality of it is that uh, you know being older that that just wasn't going to happen but one thing i could do is i could go out there for a long period of time and accomplish the same thing so it was uh, sort of a mixed uh, message that I was giving myself. On, on the one hand, it was very gratifying that I could go out there and do it. Uh, on the other hand, I was just beating myself up. So about at a thousand miles, I just let it go. And I just said to myself, you know, however long I have to stay out here, that's what I have to do. And once I kind of flipped the switch in my mind, I, I think that helped a lot. Um, and you speak about injuries. Well, the first six days, six and a half days or seven days, I was doing an average of 70 miles a day. And what that was doing, it was eating into the time that I had to sleep. Mm -hmm. So the first days I was doing that in, you know, maybe uh, 14 hours. And then the next day, guess what? It was like 15. The next day it was 16 hours. Then it was 17. Then it was 23 hours. And all of a sudden it's like, I, I just, I just can't keep it up. So uh, there was no resetting the mind. There was just, you know, you can only do so much. So I came to that realization and, um, you know, it was good that I did because I kind of hit the sweet spot where I could function uh, doing the uh, maybe about 60, 62 miles a day was always my target. I did have, <clears throat> excuse me, a few off days that were very low mileage that pulled my average average down to, uh, it almost equated to two marathons and a, a half marathon a day. So it was about 58 and a half miles, just under 60 miles per day. But um, yeah, take for instance, uh, let's see, what was the, uh, the first injury I had uh, was in Delta, Utah. And uh, mostly what they were, were uh, foot injuries and things like that. Um, you know, a torn ligament on the outside of my foot or, um, you know, just uh, aches and pains. I dislocated my femur uh, when I was at about 1500 miles and got it popped in and it was fine. So. You know, the lesson is, is that no matter ha what happens, you can problem solve. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're focused enough, if you have that desire, and that's, that's the main thing, you know, everything's off the table unless you have that burning de desire to finish and, and do it and do it right. Um, so, you know, I think once I, I tapped into that, I was, I was much better off. That's great. And, and uh, how, how many days, what was your final uh, when you reached? It was New about 50, 52 and a half days. Yeah. And it was, um, let's see, it was 3,063 miles. I have to look at my book title yeah. because it's, 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 it's like, yeah. you know, I can remember it's like 3,060, was it two or three or four? It really doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is great. And I had a master's record at the time and just a few days behind the, the, the all-time record um, at that, that, that time. Um, oh, yeah, it was more than a few days. Frank Giannino uh, held the record. And, oh, gosh, that was, uh, what was his record? 66 uh, miles per day or something. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it was, uh, and, of course, Pete Kostelnik, uh, I don't know if you guys are going to talk to him. He's he's a rock star. That guy yeah. is just in my book. Uh, I don't know of anybody who can, you know, keep going and do that type of mileage and things like that. And incidentally, with your thousand mile run, uh, I see you have Pat Farmer, and he is he's my hero. That oh, that guy is so he is as tough as nails. Yeah, yeah, he's on the Australian it. team, and actually, yeah. he's the coordinator, technically the event director, over our team yeah. for the event. This is his. This is his dream, and we're part of his dream, and we're incredibly honored to be part of it. He is a badass, but he is also oh. just the sweetest human being. He's so yeah. sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
South Pole or hi. North Pole to South Pole. North Unbelievable. North and North I, North I first North became North. familiar with him when, uh, you know, I was going to do uh, the run across the United States back in 91, 92, and then it fell through for me. But I believe he was part of that, too. Yes. Yeah, I've been telling people that uh, I'm a I'm junior league on this team because I've only crossed <laughs> one continent, uh, and, and I'm always telling people that uh, no matter uh, what what you've done, there's always somebody else out there that's done something uh, even more extraordinary. So it's it's a humbling humbling uh, sport. Uh, this adventure. It it really puts things in perspective. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I. And, and, and Sam and I are doing these, these interviews somewhat in part to talk to people that have crossed the country for sort of practical advice on how to do something like that or something even specifically, but also the, the part of uh, A Thousand Miles to Light um, that we're raising money for is for uh, mental health, especially this organization in Australia, Reach Out for uh, Youth Mental Health. Um, so wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I know that was a central theme in, in uh, your most recent book. Yeah, so um, yeah, my most recent book that came out about a year ago, just right in the midst of the pandemic, basically. And Can I had- Couldn't have planned that uh, better. Couldn't have planned that no, better. No, I, I, I didn't plan it at all. In fact, it took me four or five years to write it. And um, I thought to myself, I'm going to make this one count because it's the last book I ever want to write. That is mm. excruciatingly painful for me to sit down and try and write something. Uh, so it took quite some time. And then, you know, we just happened to finish it when the pandemic came out. And the message was just so tuned to that, where people were cooped up inside. They couldn't go outside. And so, uh, you know, I just encouraged them you know, what's safer than being out in the environment by yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could go unmasked as long as there weren't other people that were in close proximity. And um, so I come up with some statistics about, uh, you know, how healing that is for people uh, on a mental, uh, on the mental stage. So, uh, you know, I talk a lot about that and I weave a lot of uh, the adventures that I did in the past to sort of give an example of that um, and talked about, you know, how you have to be kind to yourself, uh, you know, how you have to have focus, all those messages. But the, the most important message is to get outside and stay outside as much and as long as you can. A hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah, I think it's, a, I think it's a risk of people that, you know, you're told to stay inside and here in Australia, especially they're going through a lot of lockdowns. Um, and uh, one of the few things they are allowed to do is go out and exercise. But uh, I think a lot of people, they're told to stay at home and they, they take that almost too literally and, and literally stay inside and, you know, watch Netflix all day. And, 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 and even, uh, I think even people like, like me, I, I got here after being the first 24 hours of, of lockdown, I didn't have a, a, a treadmill or anything and, and got a little lazy and, and spent way too much time on the couch before I finally started moving around and, and figured out I could just do lunges and push-ups and there's got to be some way to move your body. So, so it's, it, 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 uh, when, when, when you're told to, to shelter in place or stay at home, I think there is a little bit of that risk to take that a little too, too literally that it, uh, you know, there is the outside almost always, except for Sam and I, and then these few people that we're, we're literally stuck inside. But uh, but for most of, most of uh, the world, it, even if you're in quote unquote lockdown, doesn't mean you can't go out and exercise and breathe some fresh air and walk around the block or, or you know, keep going a little further, a little further until you're, you know, out in the woods or going across the country. Yeah, and it is kind of interesting because uh, you can see how, um, you know, the technology sort of changed to almost create um, as close to real life situations, you know, take for instance, like your pentathlons and stuff like that. They try and create situations where you're outside and, you know, this and that. And I, I think that's, that's really good but nothing beats the real thing. And that's to get out there and, 
you know, if it's cold, you feel the bite of the cold. And, you know, there's something to be derived from that. There's, there's something about, uh, it uses all of your senses um, instead of just, you know, your, your brain, you know, the cerebral thing that's going on. Yeah, and there's an energy out there that is a power source as far as I'm concerned. I always say I'm solar powered because I like the heat and I like to run through deserts and things like that. But, you know, the, the air, the cold, the experience of the heat, the experience of the dirt and, you know, the plant life and all of that kind of stuff, there's an energy, right? Yeah. So in a way, it's like yep. plugging yourself back into humanity when you walk out mm -hmm. our doors and use your physical body. Right, yeah. I agree 100%. Yeah. Well, Marshall knows something about heat being uh, Mr. Badwater and, and anyway, spending a lot of time, a lot of time in Death Valley, um, most of the time in the summer. But I've also was was watching. Uh, looks like you spent some time in Death Valley this winter, too. Yeah, yeah I did. It, uh, it was something I'd been thinking about doing, oh, probably for a half dozen, maybe six or eight years, something like that. And, you know, that was to uh, do a winter bad water. And of course, that doesn't sound like too much because, you know, the first hundred and I guess 30 miles or so, you've got very temperate weather and the parameters that are set for that are the opposite of doing it uh, in the summer. So instead of the July, August window, you have to do the January, February window. And so January, February, uh, temperatures in Death Valley are, you know, 65 to 75, that may get up to 80 degrees, but then you get on Mount Whitney and hold on to your hat or it's going to blow off. <laughs> and really about the only way that you can get up the mountain or the safest way, believe it or not, is a six mile route instead of the 11 mile route that goes up the Mountaineers uh, chute. Uh, so there's a lot of snow up there. You're on crampons, you're bundled up, you've got, uh, you know, 20 below sleeping bags. And uh, it took me two and a half days uh, to get up it. And, you know, for, you know, just going up six miles, you go up a couple of miles. And I mean, you know, I was pretty well whipped. Uh, so you go up two, 3000 feet and, you know, with the, the wind and cold and you're in your face and uh, it was a whole different ball game. So um, it was, yeah. uh, it was good. Well, you didn't show up there fresh. You ran from <laughs> the basin, right? And then right. you ascended. Yeah. So you didn't show up all, <laughs> you know, fresh and perky. You were already pretty well taxed. That's amazing. That's, that's insane. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, then... just another, um, you know, something that somebody else hadn't done. <laughs> that's that creative part like you were yeah. talking about finding right. the artistry. Thing. Artistry. Uh, right. and for those, that, for those that don't know the the bad water what we're talking about is from the lowest point in north america up to the the highest point in the southern uh, contiguous up, up on mount whitney uh and you were you were um you were also raising money for charity in that in that run weren't, uh, correct yeah i was so um you know, many of the people who are tuning in uh, might have seen, it's called the world's toughest race. And that's, you know, the old eco challenge. And that's Mark Burnett and Bear Grylls was the face of it. And uh, so I've done a lot of adventure racing. In fact, uh, Adrian Crane and myself are the only two in the world that have done all 10 eco challenges. Um, wow. Now that's not finishing all 10. We finished eight of them, but we participated in particularly in this last one. We were more participants. The average age of our team was, I believe it was 66 or maybe it was 67, something like that. So um, one of my friends who, you know, that's Team Stray Dogs that we christened way back in 1995 when we started doing adventure racing. And Mark was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's at the age of 64. And he's 67 and soon to be 68 years old and uh, he was out there doing that race uh the eco challenge race and the story if you um it's on amazon prime it's called the world's toughest race and uh he's featured in it you know i make an appearance here here and there but uh you know it's one of those things where we talked about that we connect with other people and some of those people become lifelong friends mm -hmm. and um 
we have a, I don't want to say duty, the pleasure of helping them through rough spots. And Mark is, is going through, you know, some rough spots, you know, as we speak. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, I kind of lost my, <laughs> um, what I was, you know, delving into and talking about, I just, uh, you know, go off on, on that, uh, segue and it's, uh, you know, it's very important to me. Was that the nonprofit yeah. that you were doing the winter bad water for? Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it was the Alzheimer's okay. Association. So, you know, our goal was to raise uh, $14,505, which is, you know, the height of Mount Whitney. And I think we're, we're still, you know, getting a few, some of the donations are trickling in still, but uh, I think we raised about 15,500 or something like that. So, um, so cool. we met our goal and then some. So, and hats off to you guys for what you're doing too. That's that's what uh, really makes it meaningful. It does. How yeah. can people find that and donate now if they still wanted to, since the site is still open? Well, what they should do is they can go to the Alzheimer's uh, or they can go to, they can look on my website, you know, okay. marshallolrick.com and there should be something that. But okay. uh, the team that we, it was... Um, it was team endurance, uh, so or or excuse me, team endure, and so we are raising money for team endure, and my name was associated with it. So if you okay. if you go on the website or something, you'll see it. Perfect. Marsh, do, do you have uh, obviously you've been able to do this for quite some time. Do you have any advice for people as far as how to, um, you know keep yourself at it and injury wise, mental, mental health wise, any, any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of people just go out and hit it day in and day out. And, you know, I used to do that too, for the most part without taking a break. So, uh, you know, you can take it a little, a little bit over. Shan's over right, the above, me. Shan is right <laughs> above me in my hotel room, literally yeah. directly above me. Our treadmills are on top of each other at one floor up. And I'm like, he's dropping the hammer. I got to get back on the treadmill. Guilty of charge. Um, but, uh, you know, in regards to that, uh, there was always November, December of each year that I would pretty much take take them off and I wouldn't run a step. Yeah. And yeah. what it allowed me to do, I think, is it increased my longevity because everything could heal up. Mm. And uh, I think more than anything, it was good for me mentally because by the time I got around to January or February and really started getting back into it and ramping up my training and things, it um, I came back fresh. And so mentally, you know, I was looking for that again. Uh, and, you know, I, I just think it, uh, it goes a long way if you can just kind of be a little bit kind to yourself here and there and treat yourself to, you know, at least, a, you know, I, I advocate taking a day off a week. I don't care what now. And I never used to say that, uh, you know, I go out and hammer, you know, I try to do 12 miles a day, no matter what. And then on the weekends, I do 20 to 30 miles on Saturday and the same on Sunday. So, mm -hmm. but, um, then I think what happens is uh, you can uh, start neglecting things that you really should be paying attention to. And I guess that's a second part of it that, uh, you know, if you can kind of step back from the running or whatever activity that you're doing and, you know, just love so much and are so intense about and, um, you know, step back and, and reconnect with your family and friends and, and uh, uh, just, uh, uh, pay attention to the things that are really meaningful in life besides running, because we may fool ourselves and say, you know, uh, all my life is about running. And I think for some people it may be. And for me, it was a, a way to survive. But uh, if we can just step back occasionally and, and pay attention to, you know, smell the roses. Mm. That's great. So uh, obvious next step, um, we planning anything new. Anything coming up in the horizon? You know, I, I really don't have anything. And I, I say that, but, you know, it takes me a while to sort of 
you know, get over what I did the last time. And, and like that winter crossing, it took me probably three or four weeks where I could really walk on one of my, one of my feet, my left foot was, was really, really bothering me. A lot of swelling. Uh, I had a lot of edema, uh, you know, retaining water and stuff like that and swelling and so on and so forth. And so it's like, oh man, you know, so there's no way that I could have gone out and ran. So I, I sort of just backed off a little bit and I'm just now gradually going back into it. And then Mark, the person I was talking about that has Alzheimer's, him and I will go out three or four times a week and we'll usually do five or six miles up on Evergreen Mountain and, um, you know, just, just enjoy ourselves. But, you know, to answer your question, I really don't have anything. Uh, I had mentioned walking across the United States with, with my wife, you know, that would be great. Uh, I'm sure something will come up, but uh, it has to be toned down because I just don't have the speed and I have to be, you know, take care of my body more and more because it just doesn't recover as quickly. And, you know, I have aches and pains that I didn't used to have. And, you know, this getting old isn't for sissies, man. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I think I'd, I've done a little bit of the same, especially when there's something so big. It's hard to plan beyond that because you don't know what kind of shape you're going to be in at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When I finished my 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 USA run, uh, I, I certain and people warn me about it. every. I think you you and other people that that I talked to, everybody said uh, you know plan on something, but don't don't get too ahead of yourself. Uh, and uh, and most people talked about feeling uh, kind of a bit of a letdown, um, which I even though I saw it was uh, coming and, and everybody warned me about it, I still felt it. So I, I finished in, uh, on December 1st in, in Connecticut. And uh, I could tell you most of, most of December and, and first part of January, I really didn't have uh, any idea what I was going to do with myself uh, in part because uh, my, you know, uh, the pandemic was still going on and, and uh, my career was in turmoil. And uh, so it was, uh, it's something to, if people are going to do something like that or, uh, you know, anything big, something to be aware of. I think at least being warned about it helped, um, but I still had to go through it. And uh, it was helpful to kind of uh, slowly come about to what are we going to do next? Yeah. Well, you know, and as it, it speaks to, um, you know, I, I, I think intuitively you become a better runner and you know how to fuel yourself, you know how to keep going. And I think the same thing holds true. Uh, you know, after you finish the run, just be kind to yourself and listen to your body and give it what it needs. And maybe that's rest. And so just do it. Don't, don't force the issue. Mm -hmm. Hey, Marshall, I have a question for you based on all of your years of doing these adventures and really self, self-driven, self-motivated, self-planned and orchestrated. Um, what are the things that you've learned the most about yourself in the course of this journey? I, I think more than anything, I just, I, I like to lay claim to just being an average guy and what I've discovered, I am just a very, very average guy. And the, uh, you know, with age and everything, you, you know, it, it really drives that home. Um, you know, and I think uh, the other message is it's kind of a, a dichotomy of sorts, but, uh, you, you know, you, depending upon your age and things like that, but I mean, uh, I discovered that I could do and recover faster, do more, um, than I'd ever dreamed of. And, uh, I think it's very interesting because, uh, take for instance, with, uh, with bad water, I had some pretty good times out there and, um, I look back and it's like, who was that guy anyhow? So, you know, it seems like you almost remove yourself and step back and look at it. And it's not that, it's not that I'm, you know, I'm proud of what I did, but I'm not, um, so focused on it, I, I, I don't think that it means a whole lot to me now. It's like all the buckles and stuff that I have, I have up at a rental house of mine that we do for VRBO. And, and it's interesting because it's a big trophy case and it's got, you know, gazillions of buckles. And, you know, my, uh, I think there's, I think I've got four or five number one bad water, wow. you know, numbers and stuff in there. 
<laughs> it's amazing. And there's a summit suit for Everest that's up in the attic that I leave up there with oxygen tanks. And probably one out of 10 of the groups that go up there actually even say anything about it. <laughs> and I think to myself, I, it actually makes me very happy because they're probably focusing on nature and their kids and their family and having fun. And, and it's like, you know, why should you be impressed by anything that I've done? You know, go out and do something that uh, sets a good example for somebody else. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've learned that too, not to take yourself. And I, I, what I always tell people is when you start taking yourself too seriously, or when I did, I was in trouble. Mm -hmm. If, uh, you know, if I could just, you know, not take myself seriously, then I seem to do the best. Mm. Give yourself permission. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll get there when I get there. I'll do the best <laughs> I can do at this moment. Today, I have this yeah. day. I have this day. I don't know how it's going to go, but I have this day and I'm going to go for it. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. the story of the pandemic? I mean, to be clear, what else do we know besides this moment and the unpredictability of what we're living through right now collectively. I think it's so incredibly powerful. I think so much power can be held in that, but people are feeling really hopeless and discouraged. What do you have to say to that? Well, I think for the most part, uh, we like to have a certain amount of control in our lives. And, you know, I can liken it to when you're out there, you know, running across the US or running a race or something like that, and something happens and it's unexpected. And so, you know, it's kind of like, there's no way that we can really prepare for that unexpected, but there's so many things that are literally out of our hands that we have no control over. Mm. And, um, you know, if we just do the smart thing and what is, you know, and I don't say this selfishly, you know, take, take care of ourselves. Uh, because when you start taking care of care of yourself and you're kind to yourself then you can reach out to other people and do the same for them that's right I guess that's what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. so um you know some things are just out of our control this whole pandemic is out of our control but um you know there's certain things certain things that mitigated like you know I, I don't want to get political or anything but immunization and stuff like that so you know if there's something that's scientifically based or whatever. I, I mean, you know, we can kind of mitigate things a little bit. So, you know, so sorry about that. I just had to, <laughs> it's okay. had to kind of go off on, <laughs> on that tangent. <laughs> yeah, well, when you think about um, moments for yourself on a big adventure in the middle of a hardcore race, did you ever feel hopeless? Uh, and if you did, where did you find hope? How did you turn it around? Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess hopeless is, is the right word. Um, you know, the example, when I was running across the, the United States, there were two or three times where mm. I just, you know, get into the van. There were a couple of times I just bawled. You know, I just cried. I mean, you know, I just couldn't contain myself. It's like, this is just so so bad so awful and um uh i'll use an example it was uh, about midway across the united states and i can't remember exactly what town it was but we pulled over to the side of the road and we just we just happened to didn't pull over but the the rv was pulled over and so i ran up to it and then you know we looked out in a pasture and it was it was um October 30th or something and they were having you know a bunch of kids were having a big Halloween party and stuff like that and they had trampolines and all that and I had I had just stepped out of the uh, travel trailer uh, and and uh, I, I you know I was beside myself and I looked over and saw that and I'm sort of integrated and mixed myself in that group of kids for about 30 45 minutes and it was just so joyful and everything and it, it was just like osmosis that all that came into me and gave me the strength to go on so um i i guess you know the moral of that story is you have to look for those things and if you don't look for them you'll miss them uh okay. so you really have to pay attention uh while you're out there where where you're in the throes of competition or whatever there's always something out there 
that will inspire you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes I, it's I, a brief exchange. Sometimes it's something you know like that. What were you going to mm -hmm. say, Shan? Did yeah, I was, was going to say, I remember watching the documentary and reading your book about your crossing and uh, those moments were uh, it, it, uh, amazing tape. I encourage anybody to watch it. it. It was something where you could you could see raw, raw emotion up up close. And uh, it, what I and while that's something that I didn't want to uh, go through myself during my crossing, it did make me appreciate other moments in, in races where I pushed myself to the limit um, that uh, you know, it's some, sometimes you have to let yourself feel that there's, there's going into the pain cave, there's, there's ignoring the pain when you can, and then sometimes you just have to accept it, break down and start back over again. Yeah, that's, that's a very good analogy. If you acknowledge to yourself that what you're doing is very difficult, and that, you know, your life is really crappy, if, if you acknowledge that instead of ignore it, it allows you to move on. Right. Mm -hmm. And let it go. Well, there's so much energy that is required to fight it. Right. So the mental right. fatigue, the emotional fatigue with resisting that suffering element or that pain or that, you know, emotion that alone is draining and you can't afford to allow that energy to be zapped, you know? No, absolutely. No, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. So resiliency is the other thing. Obviously, you are um, the man of resiliency. If we look up in the dictionary, I'm sure your face is right there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another thing that's been required during the uh, the pandemic, of course. You know, and every single race that you've towed the line at, or every race that anybody or any big adventure or any big challenge in life, it doesn't have to just be an endurance sports, right? Life is full of challenges. You've had plenty of them that are outside of sport and everybody has, you know? So resiliency is really something that we all need just to be humans in the world, living this life. Yeah, and the, uh, you know, I think resilience, um, I, I, you know, it is, it's how we're taught. It's, it's a learned behavior to a certain extent in them. I think there's a part of it that uh, is maybe ingrained. It's, it's just part of us, uh, but I still think it's, you know, primarily learned. Uh, and I do think that uh, if we're faced with uh, adversity and we overcome it, I think we get better at it. I think we become more resilient. It's a muscle that has to be worked, hmm? like every other muscle in the body. Mm -hmm. Shan, do you have any other questions about the crossing specifically or Marshall's experience? I'm sure we could talk all day about some of the, the, the nitty gritty and the stories, but this has been, this has been great. Um, Marsh, what was the, what's the name of your latest book? I, I read it a few months ago and I encourage anybody to take, take a look. It's very, uh, like we were talking earlier, it's very it's poignant and it's timely. Yeah, so it's, it's called Both Feet on the Ground. Uh, you have subtitle a copy of it there that you can put up. Yeah, and it's reflections from the outside. So uh, if you see, there's little icons of the four elements. So what I do is I break uh, the book down into four parts. So there's examples of air, you know, uh, fire, water. Uh, take for instance, air. I tell stories about um, Mount Everest mm -hmm. and dealing with that. So. You know, it's, um, it's multifaceted. Uh, a lot of people, when I uh, wrote my first book, Running on Empty, they said, but you didn't talk about Mount Everest. You didn't talk about this or that. A lot of the experiences in Death Valley, uh, such as the um, self-contained, um, not self-contained, but um, uh, self-supported circumnavigation of Death Valley, 425 miles, 16 days, you know, I talk about that a lot, uh, you know, some of the things. So that's the fire part, of course, mm -hmm. of the book. And, uh, you know, what you've learned, what I learned from it, uh, you know, the lessons that, uh, what you can take away uh, from it. Uh, so, you know, all those things. So, yeah. Actually, that does remind me of a, one more question, Marsh. Uh, you've written a couple of books. You mentioned it took took you some time. Um, I think a, a lot of people have a creative endeavors like writing a book or, or things like that that are so big 
Um, any advice on how to get started, how to get into it? Please. For... <laughs> yeah, it's like anything else. It's like ultra running it or running it. It looks like it's pretty easy. And then you get out there and all of a sudden you have to start taking care of yourself. You have to figure out the fueling. You have to figure out, you know, clothes and, you know, face uh, different obstacles such as weather and so on. With the riding, uh, I think more than anything, just like ultra running, it's uh, getting over the fear of having to go out there and deal with something, the, the unknown. And so with me, it, uh, you know, I wasn't the most stellar student in high school. <laughs> I probably had a C or a D average. I just couldn't pay attention. Uh, so writing was very difficult for me and I had to sort of relearn, uh, you know, English and my wife is great at editing. So. Um, what I would, what I would say to, to people is, uh, you know, the best way is to just start writing short articles. And, um, I think what is the most interesting or what people are most interested is if you're perfectly honest, even though it may expose you in a way where you know that people are going to judge you. Uh, instead of, you know, take, for instance, I could have just talked about my accomplishments without having some reason for it. So, you know, be very specific and, you know, peel those onion layers mm -hmm. apart and just start small with, with uh, small stories. Um, you know, I've been writing and jotting down notes uh, where um, I had, I think, over a thousand pages of notes and sometimes I would boil um, maybe 20 pages down to one paragraph. So, you know, it becomes very succinct and um, it's, it's a skill and I certainly haven't mastered it and I had good people helping me along the way. So that would be the other thing. If you, uh, you know, have somebody that can, you, you can give your manuscript to and say, you know, take a look at this, what do you think and be completely honest. And then if you need to ask for help uh, from a professional, go out and get it. Um, and I don't know what your goal is just to um, self-publish or something like that. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Or you know, to get it sold into a big publishing house, which is an entirely different thing. Uh, it just, it, um, it takes a lot of sweat equity to get it done. Uh, but it's just like you know, running a hundred or a thousand miles or whatever it is, uh, you know, you can do it. There's, if, if you have it in your mind and you have the desire to do it, as I said before, you can do it. Well, congratulations. And, and uh, what I appreciated about it was exactly what you just said, which it was obviously very honest and, and candid and, uh, and it wasn't just about accomplishments. You could, you could really uh, yeah, kind of get to the soul of the person. So that's very well done. Yeah. When you were running across the United States, did you ever feel like people that were on the outside watching you? It was, it, it was kind of like watching paint dry, wasn't it? <laughs> it, it, can, it can be. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, uh, you know, our sport, uh, you know, if you were to watch it live on TV, Absolutely. <laughs> we were talking about people running slowly in the woods. So, <laughs> so not so great, but if, but if you could do it uh, like the, um, uh, oh, I forget the producer of, of the adventure races, but like if you could, if you could tell this Burnett. background and the stories, Mark, if you, if you get somebody like that, who can really pull out the stories of the individuals, then suddenly it's something that, uh, that, uh, you know, has a lot of, I think, interest for people. Uh, I'd love to see it. We've been watching the Olympics. I, I think it's time to get a hundred K mount or a hundred mile mountain mountain race uh, in the sport. Uh, uh, I'm going to show my biases, but I, I think it could replace race walking anytime. Um, Cause uh, that's been, that one's been grinding my gears for quite some time that we've got <laughs> race walking. And then right before we have <laughs> uh, mountain racing, um, but that's that's me. I'm, I'm probably going to get a lot of angry race walkers. Um, <laughs> you know. A few nasty grams. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's like who are, it's like seeing who can whisper the loudest. It just seems silly to me. But anyway, sorry. I'm, I have friends who do that. Watch out. Yeah, they're going to be getting <laughs> us up. 
<laughs> to each well, his own. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. I think the hundred kilometer race would be, you know, a natural fit for the Olympics. Uh, but uh, you know, the coverage would be really spotty. They, you know, <laughs> they have the right long mountain. commercials and they, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they. But you know what people don't realize is, uh, you know, if you're really good at it. Those guys are running really fast. fast. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know, it's it, it's deceiving. You can follow them with a helicopter if you get the right course, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That'd be yeah. amazing. Hey, yeah. before we close, I want to ask you um, one question. So, Marshall, what does endurance mean to you? Uh, you know, endurance is uh, to me, it's um, perseverance, sticking with. Uh, you know, when when you put yourself out there and you say you're going to do something and it can be very, very difficult, you know, it takes a certain amount of uh, bravery. And, you know, of course, endurance is wrapped up in that, too, to stick with it and follow through. And, uh, you know, we have to remember that uh, we're setting an example for other people and, uh, you know, it may impress them, you know, who cares. But if it has a role in their life where it betters it. Uh, just by watching you go out and do those, uh, you know, as slow as paint dry type um, endeavors or whatever, you know, that's that's endurance. I think people stand up and notice if you endure pain, you endure distance, you endure whatever. It shows that uh, what the human spirit is capable of uh, more than anything. That's beautiful. Well said. Thank you. Where can people find you if they want to follow your adventures, pick up your book, learn more about you or donate to one of your causes? Yeah, just uh, marshallulrich.com. Okay. They can go there. And we try and I, I try and update it. I think one time it was about three or four years before I updated the, so I'm not that good at it, but it's been updated recently, particularly because, uh, you know, we finished the eco challenge and um, I have a blog there uh, that uh, talks about they can they can get enough uh, uh, information whether where they'll uh, want to puke. <laughs> are you on social media at all, or is that not part yeah. of your, you? Are okay. Facebook, but you know I I don't do so much you know okay. of that. I just uh, you know it doesn't doesn't mean that much to me. But uh, you know every once in a while I'll. I'll chime in and, you know, for fundraising, it's very effective. Perfect. Shan, do you have any closing thoughts? I think this has been, this has been great, Marsh, a lot of fun and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Okay. All Marsh, right. Thank you so much for your time. It was an honor. Can't wait to see you in person one of these days, hopefully. I don't know. Shared adventure. I'm in. <laughs> okay. Well, thank right, you, darling. Samantha and Sean. I really appreciate being on the program. Likewise. Take care. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Bye.